So an important preface to start with, freeways are one piece of a larger system. They do not exist in a silo. Freeways are like the spine of the Bay Area's transportation system, critical to our region's mobility and inherently connected to the choices we make around land use, equity, the environment, funding, sustainability, the economy, and more. Focusing on transportation and land use, this photo overlooking I-580 on the dublin Pleasanton border illustrates just some of this interconnectedness. We see a major freeway corridor intersecting with rail, bus, bike, and pedestrian networks, all running along newly built housing communities and small businesses. The policy decisions made in one area of this photo will affect the use and viability of another. This is a core principle defining how we plan for the future of our freeways and the Bay Area's transportation system as a whole. This photo also represents just one small corner of the region. Broadly speaking, the Bay Area struggles with longstanding imbalances between land use and transportation policies. A lack of interconnectedness, if you will, which contributes to the challenges we'll be discussing today. Which brings us to the subject of problem solving. Focusing in on Bay Area freeways, many of the challenges we face fall within three primary buckets that need to be addressed. Starting with inequity. When this 20th century infrastructure was originally built, communities of color that had developed over generations were bulldozed and sliced through to make room for these freeways. Since then, those freeway adjacent communities remain systematically disadvantaged as a direct result of their proximity to this infrastructure. How do we address the, the mistakes of the past? Next, we'll talk about funding. We have effective mechanisms for funding transportation operations, maintenance, and improvement, but they're having limited success in achieving the congestion reduction goals that we set for those investments. We bring in revenue to build bridges, widen freeways, expand transit, yet traffic delays continue to grow. So how do we adapt our investment strategies to ensure we get more bang for the buck? Which brings us to the problem of congestion itself. Investments that uphold our longstanding reliance on cars with an ever-rising population pushes our freeways over the edge of their design capacity day after day after day, despite efforts to accommodate that growing demand. Things like new lanes, improved interchanges, ramp metering. That congestion is worsening, creating slower travel times and more costly commutes, particularly for those with limited means and an essential reliance on driving. How do we shift gears so that we can move more people more efficiently? These are big, interconnected challenges, and they will continue to mount if we don't change course. We need to fundamentally shift the ideology behind our land use and transportation practices so that we can restore the region's interconnectedness that is so badly needed. The concept of Bay Area freeways was first conceived a century ago. Now picture it, America, nearly 100 years ago, with the predominant ideologies of people making these early infrastructure decisions at the time. Most of us weren't alive when these decisions were being made, so it may be difficult to see at first, but from the very beginning, the choices of where freeways would be built were rooted in systemic racism, and they continue to disproportionately impact what we now recognize as equity priority communities, primarily those with low incomes and people of color. Now, it's important to understand the social and political landscape in which the Bay Area's freeways came to be. This is a map from 1937, illustrating what its authors refer to as residential security. Green was great, blue was good, yellow was not so good, and red was bad. They defined a neighborhood's desirability based on several factors, including the prevalence of non-white residents. The more people of color, the less desirable. West Oakland was deemed one of those less desirable communities. The map even describes the multiracial residents as a quote, detrimental influence, and refers to the neighborhood's 40% Black and Asian population as an infiltration. In the 1930s, as the nation's housing supply grew, the US government enacted mortgage lending policies designed to maintain racial segregation. These efforts, known as redlining, enabled banks to deny home loans to people of color looking to move outside of these redlined communities. In the Bay Area, builders had the ability to restrict the new housing developments they were constructing to white home buyers only. 
To this day, many of those same property deeds still retain the original race restriction clauses, which, while unenforceable today, are reminders of the systemic racism that shaped our region. Redlining effectively contained racial minorities in these defined geographic areas, areas that would eventually serve as future corridors for the freeways we drive on today. Let's talk about the lasting inequities of freeways, starting with their construction. One of these so-called infiltrations of people of color included West Oakland's 7th Street, a once bustling World War II era center of commerce marked on the map in green, with a slew of nightclubs where jazz thrived and West Coast blues first began to take form. But as government policy systematically drained West Oakland of its capital, the neighborhood deteriorated and was labeled a slum, further setting the stage for policymakers to design new freeways that would run right through them. Freeways tore apart the very fabric of communities built up over generations, all but sealing the fate of surrounding neighborhoods to remain impoverished and disconnected to this day. Years of new infrastructure development saw West Oakland become impacted by one freeway after another. Despite decades of community opposition to the construction of I-980 marked in orange, West Oakland became surrounded on all sides by freeways. As you can see on the map in blue, at one point, the neighborhood even had the former Cypress Freeway running through it before its destruction in the 1989 earthquake, prompting the state to build the I-880 replacement segment we know today, despite continued community opposition. Being surrounded on all sides by freeways damages more than just a community's culture and connectedness. There are also very real impacts to their health. Freeway adjacent communities are impacted by close proximity to the pollution created not just by cars, but by the additional air pollution emitted from growing freeway congestion. As a result of this phenomenon, West Oakland residents are exposed to three times as much diesel pollution than the Bay Area average. According to the Alameda County Public Health Department, these communities also have higher rates of asthma emergency room visits, along with stroke and congestive heart failure compared to the rest of the county. What's worse, longstanding policies further amplify environmental health inequities, which is evident in the air quality around I-880 compared to that of I-580. Currently, free traffic is restricted on the segment of 580 between Castro Valley and Oakland, forcing large diesel trucks in the East Bay to drive on 880, emitting more air pollution in those same historically redlined communities rather than the more affluent hillside communities. This map highlights areas in purple designated as overburdened communities in regards to air pollution, according to the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. Just to put those desperate health impacts in perspective, the health department also found that those living in the Oakland Hills outside of the overburdened zone are expected to live seven years longer than folks living in the flatlands of West Oakland and downtown. Just a quick note here. This story is by no means confined to the East Bay. The scars of redlining can be seen when we overlap those same residential security maps for San Francisco and San Jose with the paths of freeways that followed, as we see outlined in black, that were constructed throughout the mid to late 20th century. In cities across America, the devaluation and disinvestment of communities based largely on race helped justify which neighborhoods would have a freeway built through them and which ones would be spared. Now, that's a lot of damage in the name of progress. We recognize who experienced loss as a result of freeway construction, but who gained? Who was this all for? Essentially, they benefited growing suburbs like those pictured in mid 20th century Contra Costa County. It was a period in American history known as white flight, where middle class white families moved away from city centers out into suburbia. But looking back at these photos, we also recognize that much has changed. Some of the remaining inequities are still there, but the imbalance of jobs and housing availability has also pushed equity priority communities out to those same suburbs that once were unavailable to them. And rather than suffer from their proximity to freeways in the urban core, 
they now struggle with disproportionately longer, more congested, and more expensive commutes as a result of today's housing and transportation imbalance. We are all impacted by the Bay Area's congestion, pollution, and high cost of living. But I hope we can also recognize that even with the progress that's been made over the last century, those with limited means and limited opportunity continue to struggle the most as a result of freeways. Now, let's bring transportation funding and investment strategies into the conversation. The first thing to establish here is that the cost of maintaining our freeways and the cost of managing freeway congestion require two almost exclusively different pots of money. Let's start with the cost to operate and maintain what we have, the bulk of funding for which comes from state and federal gas excise taxes. Now, just a note here, transportation funding is super complex. So the breakdown we're providing is a very simplified overview focused on gas tax revenues and spending. All right, here we go. Here is a 2018 graph from the state's legislative analyst office. It breaks down the price of a gallon of gasoline. You've got the pre-tax price, which accounts for the bulk of the cost, then roughly 20% in taxes and fees. The largest portion of that 20% is California's gas tax, about 54 cents a gallon. About half of that revenue goes to state highways and transit, a quarter goes to road maintenance and rehabilitation, and roughly a fifth goes to cities and counties to support their local streets. In order to best accommodate the state's funding needs long term, our gas tax is designed to adjust for inflation. Then, oops, then there's the long standing federal gas tax, which has remained at 18.4 cents per gallon since 1993, nearly 30 years ago. 85% of these revenues goes to highways, while 15% goes to transit. Unlike the state gas tax, it does not adjust for inflation, which is one of the reasons why states like ours have had to levy local gas taxes so we can fill that funding gap. Combined, these gas tax revenues account for the largest bulk of California's dedicated transportation funding. Most of the $9.2 billion collected in gas tax revenues from drivers goes right back into the highways and local roadways that drivers rely on. Altogether, California drivers pay an average of $530 a year in both state and federal gas excise taxes. So that's the core of our transportation budget that allows us to operate and maintain what we already have. But what does that look like on the ground? How are these investments benefiting you and your community? Simply put, our gas tax dollars benefit Bay Area communities every day whether it be through routine upkeep or the occasional big maintenance project. One big fix occurred in 2017 along Highway 35 in Santa Clara County after a 200 foot section of roadway was washed out by heavy rains. Caltrans installed a retaining wall, an upgraded drainage system and constructed a new section of roadway. In cities and counties across the region, more repaving projects on local roads are made possible by the support of gas tax revenues every year. True, they may not fill every pothole, but the state of our streets would be far worse without crucial contributions from California's gas tax. Then of course, there's safety enhancements. In 2018, gas tax dollars allowed Caltrans to install mumble strips on Route 1 in West Marin to prevent drivers from drifting out of their lane. That project also widened the road's shoulders and bicycle pullouts, allowing the historic highway to better accommodate multimodal travel. And anyone driving through San Francisco's 19th Avenue lately will have noticed the roadway rehabilitation project currently underway, which in addition to providing repaved streets will improve transit priority and pedestrian safety along that corridor. Okay, so we have a sense of the regular operations and maintenance of existing roadways and freeways. But what about investments in improving or expanding Bay Area transportation infrastructure? A lot of that money comes from bridge tolls. Beyond just maintaining the system as it is, the Bay Area's unique geography and rapid economic growth 
has required significant capital projects, including new bridge construction, interchange rebuilding, seismic retrofits, and more. Some of this funding does come from the gas tax, but much of the Bay Area's infrastructure investments have come from bridge tolls. Right now, Bay Area bridge tolls, with the exception of the Golden Gate, stand at $7. Of that $7, $3 goes toward bridge seismic retrofit work. These include projects like reinforcing the San Mateo Hayward Bridge, the San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge Eastern Span replacement, and the Richmond San Rafael Bridge retrofit, all safer and more resilient against the threat of earthquakes, thanks to our toll dollars. Then another dollar of that toll goes toward regional measure one investments approved by voters in 1988. These projects include widening the San Mateo Hayward Bridge in 2003, building the West Brown Carquinas Bridge that same year, the 2004 Bayfront Expressway widening, and reconstruction of the 880-92 interchange in 2011. The next dollar goes toward Regional Measure 2 investments, approved by voters in 2004. These projects were designed to ease congestion by improving not only freeway corridors, but also expanding transit service. These investments include operating funds for Muni's T-3rd light rail, which links historically underserved neighborhoods with San Francisco's urban core, construction of the Caldecott Tunnel 4th Bore, AC Transit's Tempo Rapid Bus Service, and the BART Fremont to Warm Springs extension. The remaining $2 goes to planned Regional Measure 3 investments, which we have been unable to move forward with since voters approved the measure in 2018. As folks may know, RM3 is currently facing an ongoing legal battle in the state Supreme Court, and we eagerly await the outcome of that litigation. We also fund transportation operations and congestion management projects at the local level through voter approved sales tax measures dating back to 1976. This map shows how much each county currently pays into various transportation sales taxes. Most are specific to one county, each with their own unique investment priorities and pre-approved projects, while others encompass multiple counties, namely those that provide crucial operating maintenance and capital funding for commuter rail agencies like Caltrain, BART, and SmartTrain. All this is to say, we invest heavily in operating and maintaining our transportation system, and we invest heavily in improving and expanding our transportation system to relieve mounting congestion. So, how's that been going for us? Well, sadly, despite continued investment, traffic delays are increasing. We've sought to address growing congestion with a wide range of strategies. HOV lanes, ramp metering, new interchanges, but they simply cannot keep pace with the demands of our ever-growing population. As you can see in the graph, from 2001 to 2019, as the Bay Area's population grew by 13%, commute delays also increased by about 28%. Then of course, there's the recent short-lived drop-off in traffic delays caused by the pandemic in March of 2020. Now in 2022, we see, free, we see freeway congestion returning to pre-pandemic levels. But let's stop and think about this photo for a moment. Since 2019, the percentage of Bay Area employees working from home has quintupled, which is a fancy way of saying it leapt from 6.5% of people working remotely to 33%. And yet, congestion is back to where it was when a lot less people were working from home. Transit ridership is way down from pre-pandemic levels, while highways are packed during rush hour. In essence, we've got fewer people commuting throughout the region, but they're doing so less efficiently. That's bad. That's really, really bad for congestion, not to mention the environment, because if we assume that more employees will eventually return to the office, we could be looking at an even bigger wave of demand for freeway travel than ever before. It's all the more reason for us to re-examine our congestion management strategies moving forward. This brings us to the problem of congestion itself. Now, it's not that our transportation management strategies 
completely failed to alleviate traffic delays. It's that those improvements were relatively short-lived. Eventually, traffic always came back. But why? Let's talk about some of the key principles that we, as your policymakers, have learned over years of tackling this problem. The first and perhaps most important principle is that more lanes does not create less congestion. I'm gonna say it again. More lanes does not create less congestion. Wider freeways, double-decker highways, more bridges, none of it. Any reduction in traffic delays as a result of such efforts is short-lived and inevitably induces more demand to drive on those freeways thus bringing more cars on the road and a return to growing traffic delays. Perhaps the most iconic example of this concept is our very own Bay Bridge. Here in 1946, we see a heavy flow of cars driving across the upper deck of the Bay Bridge from Oakland into San Francisco. You got three lanes going west, three lanes going east. But what about cars traveling on the lower decks? Well, there were none. When the bridge was originally built in 1936, the lower deck of the Bay Bridge was reserved for trucks, buses, and a streetcar network known as the key system. As automobiles grew in popularity and streetcars were being phased out, it was decided that the lower deck would be converted to all eastbound car traffic, while the upper deck would serve westbound traffic. With the traffic reconfiguration complete in 1963, the bridge went from offering three lanes of car traffic in each direction, excuse me, to five lanes in each direction, nearly double the original car capacity. Perfect. For 1963. Decades later, the Bay Bridge remains one of the region's most congested corridors. But why would more lanes create more demand? Why doesn't demand just stay the same? By making the option of driving on a certain freeway at a certain time quicker and easier, you're not just benefiting those who currently use that method of transportation. You're also making those freeways more attractive for those who were previously choosing not to use them. If a road is widened, it creates more room temporarily, which helps speeds up traffic. But as people learn of this faster option, more of them choose to use it. That's why the lanes seem to inevitably fill up again. Anyone who would have previously driven off peak or taken transit or simply not taken the trip now has an added incentive to drive. On top of all that, population goes up. More people means more travel demand. And if you're adding freeway capacity, you're inviting more freeway drivers, which causes more freeway congestion and so on and so on, the cycle continues. The story of the Bay Bridge doesn't just offer us a view of the past. It provides a glimpse of the transportation future we're creating for ourselves if we don't shift gears. It reminds us that we cannot solve congestion for future generations with more lanes. We have to change our strategy. If we're to create more lasting solutions to congestion, we have to treat freeways as a finite resource. Indispensable, yes, but finite nonetheless. This brings us to the next core principle, that congestion can only be managed, not eliminated. Looking at this in the context of freeways, there's only so much room on the road and an ever-growing demand to use that road. So let's find ways to use what space we have more efficiently. This photo illustrates how much space it takes on a four lane road to move 60 people using cars versus bikes versus a bus. Now for the purpose of our conversation, let's just focus on freeways and compare the bus and the cars. The amount of traveler throughput that can be achieved by a single bus is way higher than it would be for 60 vehicles. Or to put it another way, a bus can move the same number of people across the Bay Bridge in a fraction of the time it would take for 60 cars to drive across the bridge. That's because buses use space on the road more efficiently. Now multiply that effect by the hundreds of thousands of cars that cross the Bay Bridge every day, and you've got yourself a lot of wasted space and wasted time, also known as traffic. 
Similar travel efficiencies can also be achieved by trains, ferries, and of course, bikes. Remember, more and more people will continue to populate the Bay Area and they're gonna to need to travel. As we've already established, freeways are finite and we need to move more people more efficiently. That means we can't have the next generation of drivers rely on freeways more so than we do right now. We have to adapt our transportation system to enable more people to make alternative, more efficient travel choices. Off-peak driving, public transit, biking, walking, hybrid or, remote, um, hybrid or remote work schedules, or maybe even travel modes that we've yet to invent. Everyone's needs and options will vary, but the principle of a more balanced reliance on freeways is vital to fostering a future Bay Area that works for everyone. Then there's travel behavior. Let's say you introduce a new, more efficient travel option to a community traveling from point A to point B. How do you convince them to use that new option? What's in it for them? This brings us to the third congestion management principle, that influencing travel behavior requires carrots and sticks. In other words, it's not enough to just introduce a new travel option. It has to offer you something better. Let's look at Caltrain as an example, which primarily operate, <clears throat> excuse me, which primarily operates commuter rail service between San Jose and San Francisco, along with a few weekday morning and evening trips down to Gilroy. Up until 2004, the fastest Caltrain trip between San Jose and San Francisco would take 90 minutes. Compare that to a typical driving time of 50 minutes without traffic. Now, I think most of us can recognize that when choosing between an hour long commute and an hour and a half long commute every single day, it's harder to justify the significantly longer travel time when trying to get to work, even with the high price of parking in San Francisco. Given that much of the railroad's growing core ridership was weekday commuters, the agency chose to invest in improving travel times by enhancing the corridor and train fleet to provide what we now know as baby bullet service. The two-year project required a temporary reduction in service to accommodate construction, which is reflected here in the short-term decline in ridership. But once the new track and fleet modifications were complete, the railroad saw an increase in ridership nearly every year that followed. Why? Because that 90-minute trip was now shaved down to a much more competitive 57 minutes, thanks to the baby bullet. This example illustrates the power of pros and cons, or carrots and sticks, if you will, in influencing the travel decisions that we make every day. Let's look at this comparison of pros and cons for taking Caltrain versus driving before the baby bullet came into play. The train was cheaper and allowed folks to work on the go, but it also took longer. Driving was faster, though it also cost more and reduced productivity. Caltrain could have invested in any number of new perks to attract more riders to their system, but they chose to focus on providing faster service in part because they understood travel time to be a predominant barrier for potential riders who were choosing to drive rather than take the train. Baby bullet service represented a new carrot, faster travel time, which began to dissuade commuters away from the stick of growing traffic delays and parking fees. Caltrain was always the more affordable option, but by introducing the added value of more speed, it became the faster, more practical option for more and more people. That's the type of shift we wanna to continue to foster for future generations of Bay Area residents, more carrots that attract people away from the inevitable stick of growing freeway congestion. <clears throat> and finally, you really can't talk about the challenge of convincing people to adopt alternative modes of transportation without pointing out the difficult truth that most of the Bay Area is designed to favor driving. Up until the early 20th century, most of our cities were smaller and more centralized. This is the city of San Jose in 1875. The average person lived relatively close to work, school, entertainment, businesses, 
they could get to where they needed to go by covering a fraction of the distances we are forced to travel today. On top of that, these cities were built around railroads, similar to the downtown districts running along the centuries old rail corridor now owned and operated by Caltrain. Wherever we build new transportation corridors, new cities and land development follows. And a lot's changed since the 1800s. Automobiles came into the picture, which prompted the construction of new freeways over the last century, as shown in this aerial photo overlooking the Tri-Valley. These new transportation corridors cultivated sprawling suburbs, taking up much larger swaths of land. Instead of building new communities around mass transit centers, we built suburbs almost exclusively around vehicle corridors intended for high speeds. Designing cities around cars essentially required that residents own and operate a vehicle in order to travel these longer distances. Now, nearly a century later, we face the ever-growing congestion nightmare that brought us all to this meeting today. Too many people are having to rely on driving to meet their transportation needs. Because of our car-centric built environment, mass transit becomes less effective because so many residents lack sufficient access to those alternative modes of transportation. Just take a look at this photo overlooking the 680-24 interchange in Walnut Creek. These highways were built in tandem with the surrounding suburbs that followed, assuming the residents would primarily rely on driving. Then, as congestion mounted and we decided to build trains, the railroad entered a built environment that wasn't designed to accommodate for it. Services like BART are critical to both congestion relief and providing essential transportation service, but the train can't fix everything on its own. Mass transit needs to be accessible to the masses in order for it to work well. To accomplish that, a transit corridor has to be given the right built environment, like more dense housing and job centers near stations that empower more people to adopt this vital mode of transportation. Whether it's trains, buses, ferries, or bikes, it's often impractical for us to change our travel behavior because the built environment that so many of us live in today simply wasn't designed for anything but driving. Many of our cities were designed to make driving the easy choice, if not the only one. We have to find ways to better align the Bay Area's transportation strategies with its land use practices so that we can make it easier, if not more advantageous, for more people to say yes to something other than driving. Now on to the question of how we start to tackle some of these issues as we plan for the future of Bay Area freeways. How do we rebuild the fabric of communities torn apart by freeways? How do we strategically secure and invest transportation dollars to build a more sustainable future for the Bay Area? How do we adapt our congestion management approach to meet the travel demand that we know is coming? Let's start with reconnecting equity priority communities. Innovative efforts are underway right now in cities across the country to help repair neighborhoods negatively impacted by freeways. Neighborhoods like those in the east side of Buffalo, New York, along the former Humboldt Parkway. This was a 55 acre park and vehicle corridor with a wide tree line meridian that served as a community space for this predominantly black neighborhood. In the 1960s, that parkway was torn out and replaced with the Kensington Expressway. Today, like West Oakland, these residents suffer from higher rates of health problems like asthma linked directly to higher air pollution from proximity to the expressway. Thanks to the federal government's new Reconnecting Communities pilot program, the US Department of Transportation and the state of New York are undertaking an exciting project to reconnect the surrounding community by creating continuous green space to enhance the visual and aesthetic environment of the transportation corridor. A proposed concept for the project calls for covering a segment of the freeway and rebuilding the historic park and street grid on top of it. There is enormous potential for projects like this, both big and small, to help right the wrongs of 20th century policy decisions in the Bay Area. While we expect new federal funds in the coming years to support mega projects like what we're seeing in Buffalo, smaller local projects will likely require local investment from cities, counties, and the state. 
We are exploring where and how reparative freeway adjacent projects could be implemented in Bay Area communities historically impacted by freeways. In line with the equity priorities, we have to have to have to tackle our housing imbalance. Again, land use and transportation go hand in hand. Much of that path forward is laid out in Plan Bay Area 2050, the latest long range regional plan developed by MTC, which gets updated every four years to account for new developments and changing circumstances, similar to what we're experiencing following the pandemic. Some of those strategies most closely connected with freeway congestion management are, to build and preserve affordable housing to ensure homes for all, empowering more people with lower incomes to live closer to job centers and transit hubs without having to endure long commutes. We also want to allow a greater mix of housing densities and types in what we call growth geographies. These are areas near transit and employment hubs um, to create more communities where people can be in closer proximity to frequent travel destinations thereby reducing their reliance on cars. We also wanna transform aging malls and office parks into neighborhoods. Again, smarter land use. If we find that alternative land use decisions are more sustainable, let's support that transition to improve everyone's quality of life. We also wanna provide targeted mortgage, rental, and small business assistance to equity priority communities. Again, making it more affordable for more people to live and work in ways where they don't have to battle with long commutes is a conscientious, equitable land use decision that also influences the travel behavior of the communities we're supporting. Plan Bay Area also includes robust transportation strategies, such as enabling seamless mobility by streamlining transit fare payment and trip planning systems, implementing per mile tolling on congested freeways with transit alternatives, expanding and modernizing the regional rail network, building an integrated regional express lanes and express bus network, supporting community-led transportation enhancements in equity priority communities, and advancing regional vision zero policy through street design and reduced speeds, and many more. Note that the plan does not include major freeway expansions. These strategies are specifically designed to make travel choices other than driving the practical, affordable, and easy choice for the next generation. Current projections indicate that the total cost of implementing these strategies, including operating and maintaining the transportation system we already have, will come out to a total of $578 billion over the next three decades. $468 billion is already accounted for. It's that remaining 110 billion that will require new sources of revenue. Which brings us to the current study behind just one of those proposed strategies laid out in the plan, per mile freeway tolling. Right now, MTC is conducting the next generation Bay Area freeway study to explore the feasibility of all lane tolling to help us achieve our vision for future freeways in tandem with the other strategies laid out in Plan Bay Area. As we've discussed, we can't keep widening freeways. Congestion is mounting and eventually there won't be enough freeway to go around. Here's where the psychology of freeway tolling can help. Part of the reason why we have mounting congestion is that we've kept the user price of driving on freeways down. We're essentially creating an overwhelming level of demand for driving that can't continue to be met by the supply of freeways that we're able to provide, which as we've already identified, are a finite resource. So how could pricing help? Well, not having a price incentive tied directly to the decision to drive on a congested freeway at the time it's congested will result in the worsening congestion that we fear. The type of worsening congestion, by the way, which has disproportionately impacted freeway adjacent communities overburdened by air pollution and has slowed the commute time for those living far away from where they work due to the lack of affordable housing. The concept of tolling is similar to the way electric companies charge more when we consume power during certain hours of the day. If we know that it costs more to do laundry between 4 and 8 p.m., it motivates us to run those machines earlier or later in the day. Then, of course, there's the added revenue. 
Pricing would help provide the means to invest in more sustainable, efficient transportation alternatives that will reduce cars on the road, directly benefiting drivers, while also addressing some of the lasting inequities of freeways. But we also recognize that pricing presents serious equity concerns for those who have no choice but to drive for one reason or another. Insufficient transit alternatives, work-related needs that require a vehicle, childcare considerations. I wanna make one thing clear. It is entirely possible that this study will reveal that the best course of action will be to not move forward with freeway tolling and instead to focus on alternative strategies, especially given equity concerns. Pricing is a possibility, but not a foregone conclusion. One thing, however, is certain. Freeways, even congested ones, are attractive, whether we have alternative options available to us or not. And for most of us, the other options are less attractive. Some of us don't even have other options. If we do nothing to adapt our transportation system and choose to maintain the status quo without identifying new revenue sources, we will be left to rely on a deteriorating freeway network, less attractive than ever, coupled by travel alternatives that will still fall short of being a viable or accessible alternative for so many. Going back to the concept of carrots and sticks, Freeway congestion is a stick. It's a cost we pay in the form of wasted time sitting in slow moving traffic, more fuel consumption, and increased air pollution. It's also a cost that will only grow more burdensome with time if we don't implement strategies like tolling to curb driver behavior and fund better alternatives. Freeway pricing has the potential to generate the revenue needed to provide for more and better carrots elsewhere in the transportation system. Knowing the impending challenges that will come with growing population and travel demand between now and 2050, we have the opportunity to introduce a new, specially designed stick to freeway travel that would fund more attractive alternatives in transit, active transportation, and more. This wouldn't simply be an investment in maintaining the system as it is. Rather, it would be the fuel we need to create a more effective, equitable system that benefits everyone. Now, there is a lot to consider here, and we need your help to inform how we move forward with this study. Right now, we're still in the early research and development phase. As we determine whether or not to move forward with pricing over the course of this two-year study, we will also conduct broader public outreach once a full analysis and draft proposal are complete. Today, we're reaching out to you, the public, specifically to ask for feedback on the draft goals of this study. Mind you, these are goals for the future of freeways, not the goals for the future of freeway tolling. They're intended to reflect what we want for the future of freeways, not how we get there. These goals have already been informed and adapted to reflect the equity-oriented focus group research that we conducted, and now we're seeking input on these goals from you, the broader public. As it stands, the goals for the Next Generation Bay Area Freeway Study are as follows. Affordable, we wanna avoid prohibitive costs on residents. Efficient, we wanna advance competitive multimodal travel alternatives and reduce traffic congestion. Reliable, we wanna improve travel time and reliability prioritizing carpools and public transit. Reparative, we wanna support community priorities and freeway adjacent communities impacted by 20th century transportation policy decisions. And finally, safe. We wanna promote safer road conditions and improved environmental health. This is a timeline of the Next Generation Bay Area Freeway Study. We've developed an equity framework to study this topic, created the draft goals that you just provided feedback on, and conducted focus groups with equity priority communities. And we're currently in the early development phase of potential freeway pricing strategies. Between now and summer of next year, we'll prioritize those strategies and identify uh, freeways for further refinement of those strategies. We'll also conduct another round of public engagement in spring of 2023, at which point we'll have a draft proposal to share and collect your feedback on detailing whether or not we recommend moving forward with freeway tolling, and if so, how.
Then by winter of next year, we'll publicly present a final proposal to our commission. It's also worth noting that the study is informed by two advisory bodies, a staff level advisory group and an ad hoc executive group that bring together diverse perspectives from both government and non-government organizations.